Hi, good afternoon and welcome. We are here in studio today. We're going to talk some sports with Val. So, of course, Val is here with me. Hard to believe that we're already through another season, Val. The uh, 2024 spring sports season has come to a close as the Rochester Zebras, our last team that was still standing, they uh, made it all the way to the semi-state semi or championship game one game away from uh, going to uh, Victory Field for a state championship game, but unfortunately ran into a buzzsaw of uh, Ileana Christian and a bunch of kids from Illinois, but uh, I'm not going to get into that <laughs> too much, but we're going to talk more about that here in a minute as uh, we get going. We'll also go back and take a look at the Benton Central game. We really haven't had a chance to kind of go over that one, and uh, of course that uh, spectacular semifinal game uh, last Saturday morning with Westview. So we'll talk that here in segment number two. But first off, how are you, Val? Yeah, it's been a, it's been a really great uh, spring sports season, and I'm, yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, a lot of, uh, and as usual, we have the usual coaching carousel, which is always seemingly a part of spring sports season as well, who's, who's new and who's leaving in the fall and winter sports. Obviously, some big news in the last couple of weeks or so with yeah. both uh, Argus and Culver needing new boys basketball coaches. At Argus, Jason Breeden left, and he is the new boys basketball coach at Knox, uh, taking over for Joe Eskridge, which was, I think Joe Eskridge leaving was kind of a surprise after just two years. He had one, I think he had one really good year and then struggled a little bit last year, but um, that, that was after some graduation losses. But Joe Eskridge stepped down, so left a vacancy. And now Jason Breeden is there, and that leaves uh, Argus looking for both a boys basketball coach and an athletic director. Right, right. Uh, That's kind of a double whammy for the Dragons. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, Argus dealt, has already dealt with the tragedy during the off season. Two days after they lost to Westville in the sectional game, in their first sectional game, Jerry Smith passed away suddenly. And I mean, he he was on the bench for that Westville game. He seemed to be in good health. And then, uh, so his 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 passing was just shocking, and I know it 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 hit uh, Jason Breeden deeply. I know those two were very close, and those you know, I mean, Jason Breeden just really uh, relied on Jerry for a lot of uh, you know, kind of mentorship, if you will, and mm-hmm. and so uh, you know, they were dealing with that, and now they it's going to be basically a whole new coaching staff. So we don't really know uh, who's kind of going to be next in line at Argus, but it'll be. Uh, you know, a team with Luke Stoltz coming back, and you know the freshman, the, the freshman will be sophomores coming back. So, they're, but certainly they're going to miss Sean Richard on top of that. So mm-hmm. again, it's right now whoever becomes the coach. Yes, you'll have you'll inherit a really really good player in Luke Stoltz and some some more experienced than typical sophomores. But then there's still going to have to be that piece of development that needs mm-hmm. to go on in terms of developing players. Yeah, and the, obviously the tricky thing in today's landscape is now is that time that those coaches need to be working with those kids. Yeah, you know June is so big in uh, basketball terms as far as working with your high school teams, mm-hmm. and so you know how quickly can they get somebody in place, and you know can they get any work in in the summer, or is it all going to be you know in October November and then you're kind of really behind the eight ball right. because you're you're kind of working from uh, a little bit you know behind. So, and the the other thing obviously too with uh, you know Jason Breeden being the athletic director is who's going to do the hiring? Yeah, you know, you, is is it going to be you know a, a a committee? You know, they've they've been through this before where they've kind of done athletic director by committee. Are mm-hmm. they going to go back to that? You know, so there's. A lot of question marks in Argus right now for uh, for winter. We finally got that answer for the girls' side, mm-hmm. you know, with uh, Brian Jennings for the girls' uh, program. But now there's a lot of questions for the boys. Yeah, but again, I, I I'm very very I was very very impressed getting to work with Jason Breeden for three years. Oh, I yeah. mean, he is. Yeah. If my math is right, he's 26 years old. Yeah, and he's got a long coaching career ahead of him, but he he just struck me as somebody who was just uh, he, he he had figured out quite a bit mm-hmm. in, in three years, and and uh, he's got a good head for the game, and he's passionate. Yeah, yeah. I think Knox got a really good one. Yeah, they did, mm-hmm. they did. 
So. Uh, as for Culver, they now need a new boys basketball coach after Kyle Evans stepped down. We uh, reported this a couple days ago. He is a new assistant coach at Marion Ancilla. I guess uh, Joel Grindle left Plymouth to join the Marion Ancilla coaching staff, and now Kyle Evans has uh, also joined that coaching staff. Of course, the new head coach is Aaron Butcher, the former Valley Athletic Director, the former Hobart head coach. Yeah. Uh, Joel Grindle will have the title of associate coach, and Kyle Evans will have the title of assistant coach. Yeah. Um, what, so, a, what a great coaching staff that he's been able to put together wow, up there. Wow, I mean, kudos, yeah, kudos to Aaron Butcher again. Kind of left a couple of high school programs, you know, s- scrambling, but boy. Right. Coach Butcher, he's yeah. putting together a program yeah. up there. Uh, Culver won 35 games in four years. Um the best year was the 2022-23 season when they made it all the way to the sectional final and lost to Marquette Catholic, and that was a really competitive team. That was, you know, the Ethan Keller, Shane Schumann, mm-hmm. uh, Joey Pizer, Oliver Morgan team. Mm-hmm. You know, those guys graduated. And then last year, um, they won nine games with kind of a whole new kind of crew with a whole new nucleus with Jack Rogers coming aboard and David Height really coming into his own as a player. Mm-hmm. And really, and, and guys like... Uh, you know Logan Caudill and um, you know and uh, and then Adria Guasp came in, so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it, it was kind of a um, Ethan Binion kind of stepped up and came into his own after a couple nice years in the JV. So it was kind of a new crew, and and, and Coach Evans kind of changed his coaching style, maybe played even a little more up tempo mm-hmm. um, this past year. Um, tough loss. Again, you know, the, the thing about Culver is they're always going to be in a conference with Triton, and they're always going to be seemingly in a sectional with Triton, and the Trojans got them twice, and that was a really good Triton team. Yeah, and they should be uh, who, tough again next yeah, year. Yeah, who beat them in the sectional. But again, uh, you know, at Culver, you look at the facilities there. The facilities have been upgraded, not only the gym, mm-hmm. but also the locker rooms yeah. and stuff. And so it's... Uh, I'm I'm curious to see how attractive this job is uh, for young coaches because it's you know it's it's not your again I don't know if there's this feeling that a you know a typical one A school a typical one A school is this tiny gym and old dilapidated locker rooms it's not like that at all at Culver yeah, yeah. same same type of situation that we were talking about with Argus that uh, you know they they need to get somebody in place of course they have a little bit of an advantage because they still have their athletic director right you know so uh i'm sure that uh, mike zayner is frantically uh mm-hmm. going through resumes and and trying to find out who's going to lead this program so right but i mean you've heard me talk about kyle Evans before he is he is as smart a coach as i've ever met in mm-hmm. coaching mm-hmm. In, 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 in any sport mm-hmm. he is just really smart and he's always really he's in tune to his kids and then he always puts in a system that works for them yeah yeah and culver's gonna miss him and i uh and and people were held accountable too mm-hmm. so uh, again it's gonna be uh i'm curious to see who takes over there and it tries to keep this going obviously with david height and the McEwen twins there there is a bit again it's not just like argus we, there's a little bit of a nucleus there with culver there's a little bit of a nucleus there yeah. obviously david heights you know it's going to be kind of his team next year and the McEwen twins will be juniors next year, but they'll be as pretty experienced juniors. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So definitely uh, going to be interesting to see, you know, how that all plays out with both Argus and Culver mm-hmm. over the next few months. Right, and of course, uh, you know, Argus joining the Hoosier North and Culver, you know, will be in a very different looking Hoosier North with nine teams instead of eight and mm-hmm. uh, some different teams there. Yeah. Typical New Valley girls have a new coach. It's Rebecca Parker. We reported this, uh, what, I think, the day before she was approved by the school board. And congrats to Rebecca, who is maybe the Valley, the greatest Valley girls basketball player ever. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was an Indiana All Star back in 2004, and you know, she's just, uh, you know, she had spent five years away from coaching, um, becoming a mom, and had three kids and she wanted to get back involved i i asked her you know what's what's her day job and she says being a mom she's still gonna you know that's still her priority and she's uh you know gonna be a mom and then coach basketball and uh you know she's just somebody who's just so respected at valley and i'm curious and uh in in a lot and she's gonna get kids attention in terms of uh you know and, and i talk with her about this like you know she, little girls can dream that they could be the next Rebecca Parker, 
because they can look up to her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or the next Sophie Bussard or the next Ann Seacrest, who, you know, girls who played um, Division One basketball. And, uh, again, I, I expect this Valley team to be um, to be really versatile. If they're going to be like, if they're going to take on Rebecca's personality, they're going to be really versatile and they're going to be really motivated at all times. You know, I, I asked her about how did Gary Teal and Trisha Cullip make you better? Mm-hmm. And she talked about they they always push me that little extra, mm-hmm. and I and I and I expect Rebecca to be that way too. Yeah, a little bit of a challenge. Obviously, it's always a challenge coming into a program, but you know they they've graduated quite a few of the girls off of that team from last year. So there's going to be some pieces coming back, yeah. but uh, you know it's it's going to be a, a little bit of a work in progress. So it'll be interesting to see. You know, it's been. Uh, Chris Kindick for a long time there, yeah. you know, and, and before that, Gary Teal. So they've been pretty stable at mm-hmm. Valley in the coaching department since early 2000s. So. Right. Uh, Ava Egolf uh, gradu- is graduating. She led Valley in scoring and rebounding last year. Yeah. Chesney Miller is graduating. It was just a defensive oh demon. Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Ava Smith, who really improved so much and hit, you know, the, she would have been the hero in that overtime game against Bremen in the sectional final if not for... Kyla Foster stealing the show from Bremen, but yeah. how much Ava improved over time, and, and uh, so I'll be curious. Yeah, I'll be curious, but I, I expect this team to to be versatile, and I expect them to be able to run the court. I, I think at first, I, mm-hmm. I think that, I think that's the way Rebecca would like to play, but we'll see if that's if that's how they wind up playing. And of course, one of her assistant coaches is her sister, Kaylin Cumberland, okay. who graduated from Valley. Kaylin is an older sister. I think she graduated in '95. Okay. From Valley. And then uh, Blaine Hartzler is going to be on the coaching staff as well. Okay. Yeah. No, it should be fun. Uh, Macy Peterson graduating as well, but they oh, yeah. didn't and get a lot of Macy last year with Macy the injury, Peterson, unfortunately. I forgot about Macy, but she yeah. was so key to that team. And, boy, when she when Macy was on that team, it was just so hard to beat because mm-hmm. they basically Macy gets every rebound. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine what they could have done last year if they would have had her for the whole season? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, was a, that was a tough blow when she went down with the injury. Yeah. So. And the thing about Macy is she did it all with a smile, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but deep down inside, I mean, she's an absolute tiger. Yeah, and, and she was just a kid I I, I loved watching play. Yeah. Uh, some new coaches outside the area. The Plymouth Boys have a new coach. It's Greg Miller, and I, I know we don't cover. Uh, again, I covered him back in my old uh, days, but Greg is a 2010 North Miami grad. Not to be confused with the Greg Miller from Valley who graduated last year's right. golfing in IUPUI, and not yeah. to be confused with the Greg Miller who was the football coach at North Miami and at Manchester. This is another Greg Miller, and this is, uh, again, Greg uh, played, uh, I think, 2010 North Miami grad and then played at Grace College. He and Bruce Grimm Jr. were teammates at Grace College. Of course, they were big rivals in the TRC back in their high school days, but one of being teammates at Grace, and, you know, Greg was a prolific scorer. He could... He could back you down in the post, but he could also shoot the three, you know, 6'5", 6'6". Six, six, six. Uh, most of his coaching experience is at the collegiate level. He was the head coach at an NAIA school in the Chicago area, just uh, outside Chicago. Mm-hmm. Trinity, is that where Trin- he was? Yeah, Trinity, uh, Trinity International, I think mm-hmm. was what it was called. So he doesn't, he, this is his first high school head coaching job, but he doesn't have a ton of high school experience, but uh, I expect... Um, I you know I, I I'm really curious to see how he does, but again they they lose a great coach in Joel Grindle, but they get a great coach in Greg Miller. So I'll be curious to see how he tries to change things stylistically at Plymouth. Mm-hmm. Um, scoring wasn't too big of a problem at Plymouth last year, but stopping people was. Yeah. And the NLC was a really really good conference last sure. year, even by NLC standards, it was really good. I right. mean, Mishawaka and Concord and. And Warsaw, I mean, they were all... Oh, Mishawaka had, yeah, they had a historic season. Yeah, made it to uh, semi-state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Concord had been down for a few years. They're back up now. Mm-hmm. Um, Warsaw's Warsaw. Uh, Coach Moore has now been there for a while. He's got his thing going. You know Northridge is going to be a really mm-hmm. competitive team every year. Uh, so, yeah. It, Wawasee was even a, And Wawasee better. is better. And Coach, yeah. Coach Lefevre. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah, Northwood is in that conference. And they won a <laughs> state championship, you know, less than two years ago. Right. Coach Wolf, you know, is always going to put out a quality team. So it's going to be an inter- interesting time to take over at Plymouth. But, uh, you know, Greg Miller is a great guy. and comes from a great family. Of course, his brother, Adam Miller, is the AD at North Miami. Mm-hmm. So I'll be curious to see how he does at Plymouth, but a, a great guy. So 
And then uh, last, the uh, here's a trivia question, Steve. Who is the new boys basketball coach at Attica? <laughs> he is from, he has coached in this area before. Okay. The new boys basketball coach at Attica. I, I have no idea. I was shocked when I found out, when I saw this name, but I'm really happy for him. Pat Skaggs hmm. is the new boys basketball coach at Attica. Hmm. It's his second stint there. His yeah. first stint ended in 1995. Wow. 29 years later, he's back. And, of course, Pat Skaggs, many of you know, won four sectional titles as the boys basketball coach at Pioneer. Mm-hmm. And then later had a really good run at Logansport. Uh, stepped down uh, to watch his kids uh, play college basketball. And now he's back. And hmm. he saw that job open, and he just, I guess he said that he was just very fond of that school and really wanted to do something to get it back on track. Uh, Attica has won two games in the last two years combined. Hmm. Boys and girls are kind of down there. Yeah. The girls program has been a little bit down there as well. So F- yeah. yeah, football's been down. I yeah. mean, they've. Yeah. I know they're, they're, they have a new football coach, and in fact, their first football game with their new coach is going to be against Culver mm-hmm. uh, in August. But yeah, Pat Skaggs is the new boys basketball coach at Attica. Hmm. He left Attica for Benton Central in 1995, and now coming full circle in his career. Wow! Wow! So congratulations to him. Yeah. Uh, the Indiana-Kentucky All-Star Games were last weekend. The girls swept Kentucky, and the boys wound up splitting. Um, the boys lost the game in Kentucky. I think there was a game. I think they played at Le- Lexington Catholic High School hmm. at a high school gym. Uh, Flory Badunga fouled out of that game, so he had a lot of energy by the time they got hmm. to. Uh, yeah, he only had like 13 in that first yeah, game. Yeah, so he, f- he had a lot of energy for Gamebridge Fieldhouse the next night. How about 31 points and 17 rebounds? A little different result. Yeah, yeah, and still they barely won the game by three, 92 to 89. Mm-hmm. But they did get a split out of that. So, um, yeah, again, for the girls sweeping, that's pretty uncommon. The Kentucky mm-hmm. usually gets at least one of those two. Mm-hmm. But good for the girls, they won both. So, yeah, it sounds like a really good – it sounds like they had about 6,500 at Gamebridge Field. I think it's a really good crowd for yeah. Saturday night. yeah. Uh, the boys' golf state finals were this week. Uh, Zionsville won the team state title. Congratulations to Zionsville. First time in 20 years that they have won state. And then um, Braden Miller of Fairfield was the individual state champion. Yeah. Won mi- minus five, five over five two. Five strokes? He won He won by five? He was won he by minus? four. He won by four? Okay. Yeah. Zionsville as a team won by five. Yeah. Okay. So congratulations to those guys because uh, I – and congratulations to Aiden Gutierrez. He played with Noah Riffle at the regional. He won state two years ago, fifth at state last year, second at state this year. Yeah. And he's going to Baylor. Hmm. And I'm kind of wondering, who at Baylor has a connection to Valparaiso? Mm-hmm. Scott Drew yeah. is the men's basketball coach. I wonder yeah. if he might have uh, sent a letter or made a phone call yeah, or sent a text just to... Yeah, because uh, Waco, Texas, is a little ways from yeah. from uh, Valpo. If you're not got some kind of a connection, you're right, right. Yeah. So, so that's uh, and then the softball state finals. Congratulations to Hamilton Southeastern in Class Four A, Western in Class Three A, Cascade in Class Two A, and Rossville in Class One A for state championships. The theme uh, of the weekend was low scoring games. Mm-hmm. Final scores of the four games were four to two, two to one, two to one, and one to zero. Yeah. So thirteen runs total in four games at bidding your last weekend yeah and i want to give rossville a, a huge congratulation for knocking off to come see the back-to-back trying to go for their yeah. third state mm-hmm. championship that's a it's a big win for for rossville yeah two to one how about Avery Layton? just a magnificent pitcher yeah yeah and uh and she's just a sophomore i th- uh i'm not sure i don't think she's very old yeah yeah and kudos to uh, Jenna Donahue, the catcher from Tecumseh, won the Mental Attitude Award. Yeah. Going to Evansville to play softball. Yep. All right. Well, let's take a quick break here, come back, and uh, we'll talk some Rochester Zebras, talk about the uh, regional and the two semifinal or the semi state games here when we get back, talking sports with Al. Stop on by to In Your Hardware for all your home project needs. With a broad selection of garden supplies, tools, and paints featuring brands like Milwaukee, Diablo, and their newest paint line, Valspar, you can be sure that Inyarts will supply you with the most top-rated equipment. And if you need something for a quick job, check out Inyarts Rental Selection to get you going. Stop on in at 1619 Main Street, Rochester, or call 574-223-4920 to see how Inyarts' friendly staff can help you. 
Pace Setters Real Estate knows that buying and selling properties can be a tough and complicated task. That's why we are here to provide you with our full service process where we walk with you every step of the way. Whether you're looking to buy a home or you're looking to sell, Pace Setters Real Estate is here for you. Call 574-223-5000 or visit us online at www.pacesettersre.net. At First Federal Savings Bank, you can bank on the go. With the First Federal Savings Bank mobile app, you can check account balances, transfer money, view account history, deposit your checks, and pay your bills. If you want your mobile banking done easy, download the First Federal Savings Bank mobile app today. The app is available for both Apple and Android phones and tablets. Just type in First Federal Savings Bank in the search bar and look for the white star with the green background. There are some things in life you just can't plan for. But here at Evans Agency, we strive to help you have all your bases covered when it comes to protecting your assets from whatever life throws your way. Whether it's home, business, auto, or life, Evans Agency has got you covered. With a heart and hand for friendship, Evans Agency has been serving the community for 20 years. Call 574-224-6988 or visit online at www.evansagencyllc.com. All right, welcome back here, talking sports with Val, and uh, let's talk a little Rochester Zebras baseball. What a historic! Let's talk run. a lot of Rochester Zebras yeah. baseball. <laughs> what a historic run the Zebras had. We're going to go all the way back to the regional game. What a great place to uh, hold a game at uh, Loeb, uh, Loeb Field, Loeb Stadium, yeah, in uh, Lafayette. That was a great place to do a broadcast, and what a day! Rochester Zebras going for their first ever regional championship against the Benton Central Bison, and after uh, after that one, Benton Central, I'm thinking probably you know losing to Rochester in the football sectional a couple years ago, and mm -hmm. and then losing in this one probably doesn't want to see Rochester on their sectional or uh, postseason docket anymore. Zebras did get one. Uh, hit there in the first, but not able to do much with it. And then Benton Central took the lead in the bottom of the first on a base hit uh, down the line. That was uh, Adrian Torres. This that, was uh, this was an outstanding play. Jake Cipher, yeah. I tell you what, his arm, not typically a you know known for the arm, mm -hmm. but uh, boy, he made some great plays in the postseason this year. And yeah, I believe he threw, he threw a runner. He threw one runner out in the regional game and in both semi-state games, if I recall correctly. But well, he had a, good, a pretty good play in that uh, yeah. Wabash game as mm -hmm. well. Rochester would tie the game at one in the uh, top of the fourth. You know, Tyler Clemmy had shut out Rochester through three, but they seemed to make the adjustment the second time through the order. Uh, Brady Beck came up big. Back to back Becks. Yeah. With hits here with Brant. Yeah, that was yeah, that was Brant Beck with the base hit and that put Rochester up two to one and as it turned out that put him ahead for good. It put him ahead for good and it put him ahead for good. And then that was a really good play at fir at uh, first base. That was uh, Reinhardt's getting the out at first base. The runner slid in, and then and Benton Central would have runners at first and third with two outs in the bottom of the fourth against Pollock, but he would get the big strikeout to end the inning. And Rochester led two to one at the end of four, and then they had a big five-run inning in the top of the fifth. Good try there on the stretch at first yeah. base, just uh, a little bit late there, and and that was just a <laughs> cannon shot to deep center field by Carson Pollock. It would go for a two-run triple, and that put the Zebras up four to one.
Caleb Lutz would come in as a courtesy runner for the pitcher, Pollock. It's going to be a close play at the plate, but Lutz is safe, and Rochester goes up 5-1. to one. But Rochester was done. That actually was the first out of the inning for mm -hmm. uh, the Zebras, so they would tack on one more run here with two outs. Mm -hmm. And that was a big two-out RBI hit by Brady Coleman that made it 7-1 to one at the time. Again, Carson Pollock pitching uh, against uh, a team that made pretty good contact on the day. Again, they used the regular dimensions here, so no, really nobody was going to hit a home run in this game, in this ballpark. Yeah, it was what four fourteen or something like that to yeah. center field. Mm -hmm. Huge turn there for a double play to end that inning. Yeah, that was a big six four three double play on uh, Balin Holm. So seven to two at the end of five innings, and then. Bottom of the sixth, that started pretty innocently. Nobody on two out. And then Benton Central would start a rally. They would have runners at second and third at this point. And this was uh, Dylan Musser, their leadoff hitter. That ball is going to drop in a shallow left field. For base hit, and with everybody running on contact with two outs, that's a two-run single. That made it seven to four. But they would get out of that inning, so seven four. And then uh, I think Brandt Beck caught, got caught over sliding the bag, trying to steal a second. He was thrown out. Yeah. So that ended the top of the seventh. It was 7-4. Bottom seven. That ball drops for a base hit, uh, kind of a bloop single, kind of and some miscommunication in the outfield. So Benton Central had runners at first and second with nobody out. That was a ball hit by Adrian Torres. And then Holmes lines out to right field and... Brant Beck, who had just moved out to right field, throws to first to Parker Casper for a 9-3 double play, and all of a sudden it was runner at second, two outs. And if It was interesting, if Brant had thrown the ball to second base, he might have gotten a double play there, but uh, as both runners just thought for sure the ball was going to drop, and then that's how it ended. Tanner Reinert's getting a call third strike to end it. And Rochester won 7-4 for the first regional title in school history. Yeah, and got a little interesting there in the in the sixth and seventh innings there, with, especially when Benton Central had the uh, tying run at the plate. But mm -hmm. great play there by uh, Brant back out in right field would uh, double that up, and they would get out of that. And right, Tanner Reiner's getting the save. He had really not had many relief appearances on the year. Yeah, great job uh, for the Zebras moving on to their first ever semi-state. First up was uh, Westview. Westview had been there before. They'd actually been to Oak Hill before, too. They ended up playing yeah. their uh, regional game at Oak Hill, so yeah. had some experience on that field. Right, we got, we got, right that rochester Benton central game was actually one of the few regional games that was completed on the wins, on that Saturday, June yeah. 1st. Yeah, the second game that was supposed to be played there with McCutcheon uh, did not happen on Saturday. Yeah. So uh, they got the break there having the early game and being on turf. Kind of started to sprinkle a little bit towards the sixth inning, but really started to rain then after the game. So mm -hmm. uh, fortunate to get that one in and, you know, taking on a Westview Warriors team that had made it there last year. Very young team that had gotten mm -hmm. beat in the semifinal game against Ileana Christian. Mm -hmm. This year, hoping to get back to the championship against Ileana Christian, who had won game one. Right, so. and facing Max Engel, a great pitcher who was in the top five in the state in strikeouts. Yeah. 
And meanwhile, Rochester going with Carson Pollock again after a week's rest. And that was a that, you know, Rochester had some good outfield defense in the game. Parker Casper made a great running catch out in deep center field there in the top of the first. And of note, too, the Zebras playing without shortstop Brady Coleman, who had broke his leg earlier in the week. Yeah. So that was a big adjustment. You know, a lot of people playing in positions. We had Brant Beck running uh, at uh, shortstop, but look at there. Yeah. Doing pretty good. Yeah, I mean, not only making a good throw, but making a good decision as well. Yeah. There's a good replay of it also. That's one of those things that you got to have that quick reaction to throw home, and then you got to have a great throw mm -hmm. once you do do that. And, and he did, and that's a huge play. Something you don't want to do. Yeah. Westview taking the lead one to nothing. That was what a bases was it a bases loaded hit by pitch if yeah, I recall. Yeah, yeah, hit this, by pitch uh, RBI. Yeah, this game had a lot of twists and turns. Callan Furbert got the start in right field. He made a catch there. Gavin Young, a very reliable third baseman, defensively makes the throw there, and it was one to nothing going into the bottom of the fourth. And again, the first three innings hadn't gone particularly well against Engel, who again is, again, it's not it's not hyperbole to say he's one of the better pitchers in the northern half of the state. Yeah. And not only that, but a rare lefty that the kid, the guys talked after the game, they, they saw a lot of left handed batting practice during the week expecting this. And then a huge base hit by Brady Beck. It's going to be a close play at the plate, but good slide by Reinerts as he, and the throw was just a little bit high, and Reinerts is safe, and that would tie the game at one. Again, it was back to back singles by Reinerts and, and Pollock that really got the inning going, and then an even bigger hit by Brant Beck that's going to go all the way to the wall for a two-run double. And that put Rochester up 3-1. to one. But Westview would come back. Uh, that was an RBI double, I believe, by M Miller that bounced over the fence for what an automatic double. That made three to two. And then this was how they would tie the game on a wild pitch. It gets through Cypher's leg. Miller would score, and that would tie the game at three. So Westview's right back even. But then the bottom of the fifth would happen. Nobody on two out. Gavin Young gets hit by a pitch. Some foreshadowing here as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, they had to check with the first base umpire to make sure he didn't swing at that. But the first base umpire said no swing, so it was a hit by pitch. And that brought up Tanner Reinerts. He would fall behind in the count 0-1. And, and then this would happen. Again, he had... He aligned a hit to center field against Engel his last time up, and again he's going straight away. And this is way gone. A long two run homer, and that put Rochester up 5 to 3. Then the top of the sixth would happen. And again, Westview would have runners at but second and third with nobody out.
I mean, that was kind of a weird play. They didn't score on that play. Nice job by Bowers handling the ground ball to second base. They would score on this play. Sacrifice fly to right field. And that would make it 5-4. to four. That was uh, Kaufman, the shortstop. And Rochester held him in check for the most part. He's a great player and a great hitter. Rochester kind of, he didn't do a whole lot of damage on the day. That was as close as any damage he did. But then this would happen in the bottom of the sixth. Double by Cypher, he goes to third on the ground ball, and then another double by Brant Beck and another RBI. Three RBIs in this game for Brant Beck, and that put Rochester up 6-4. to four. Going into the seventh. And again, Rochester at zero hits through the first three innings, eight hits in the fourth, fifth, and sixth combined. Yeah. Again, against a great pitcher in Max Engel, and actually forced Engel out of the game in the bottom of the sixth as they went to his cousin, Gavin Engel. Did want to get a shot of the crowd in there because it was a uh, really well represented Rochester uh, baseball team there. Yeah. So top of the seventh, and Reinerts is brought in. Again, similar situation to the Benton Central game. And he needs to get three outs for a save. Uh, he had a three-run lead to protect against Ben Central. He had a two-run lead to protect in this game. Here he gets a force out, but there's a throwing error on the throw to first, so a run does score to make it 6-5, to five, but then this happens. Cypher throws out uh, Max Engel at second. Max, remember, they'd used a courtesy runner for Max Engel earlier in the game, but he wasn't pitching anymore. So basically he had to stay in the game and run for himself this time. And a great throw and a great tag by Pollock, too. So, again... Westview's down to their final out. It's six to five. Then this happened. What an at bat by not Scott their, Yoder. Not only their final out, but their final strike. Their final strike, and he yeah. three foul balls before that, and finally an RBI double that tied the game at six. And then Jace Brandenberger, who's the number nine hitter in their batting order, that's a base hit to right field. And when the ball gets under the glove of the right fielder for an error, the run scores easily, and Brandenberger winds up a third. And then he would walk the next batter, uh, Jack Snangle, before finally getting a ground out to end the inning. But Westview did score three and took a 7-6 lead going into the bottom of the seventh. Yeah, you go from being one strike away from going to the night game to now you've got to score a run just to keep the game going here in the bottom of the seventh. Yep. So, again, by now Gavin Engel's in the game and uh, a right-handed pitcher, and Gavin Young is the first batter for the Zebras. And he again gets hit by a pitch. Hmm, a little deja vu. Yeah. Can can deja vu strike twice? Yeah. <laughs> so that brings up Reinerts, and again, Gavin Engels, from what we could tell, he was mostly a, curve, mostly a curveball guy. I don't think he was uh, a guy who threw the ball by guys enough and he throws that 0-2 pitch, and, well, that happens. Hmm. Uh, probably the biggest home run in Zebra history. A walk-off two-run homer, and the Zebras won 8-7. to And, again, I, you know, even did the old windmill dunk. And, you know... Guys have, again, you've seen teams kind of respond. I mean, it's not impossible for a team to respond after the opposing team rallies in the top half of the seventh inning, and you have to come back and you come back and do something in the bottom of the seventh. But for that, for that to happen to Tanner, the pitcher, and then for Tanner, the hitter, to do that, right, right, says a lot about him. Mm -hmm. That, and you know, Jeff Himes had just said had, had talked to Tanner, just called timeout and just said, you know try and hit the ball hard somewhere. I mean, and just kind of getting him focused on the at-bat, I think. Yeah. And to do that, and Tanner was as surprised as we were. He said he didn't think he had gotten all of that. Yeah, yeah, it didn't sound. Wind, I mean, wind might have helped it out a little bit. Yeah, you, you, you kind of hear it. The mm -hmm. first one he hit, you, you could tell, like, okay, mm -hmm. that's going to be gone. That one didn't really sound like a home run. Mm -hmm. It sounded like a, you know, somewhere in center field kind of pop-up and, that's going to be it. And no, I just carried. Mm -hmm. 
So that would set up the championship game with yeah. the two-time defending state champion Ileana Christian Vikings, and the Rochester Zebras winner would go on to the state championship game. You know, we, we knew um, going into this one, obviously, the pitching situation was going to be a challenge for Rochester. Right. And meanwhile, Ileana Christian was pretty fresh. I mean, Banstra had pitched a complete game against Madison Grant in the first game, but he's not even their ace. Yeah. Would, would, would they go with Post or with Jake Scott, who would – Jake Scott had pitched a great game against Whiting in the sectional. They went with Post, and Tanner Post was – well, he got off to – he didn't get up to a great start, we'll say that much. Um, mm -hmm. Ileana Christian was the visiting team, and Colton Fervita got the call for the Zebras on the mound in this game. And as you mentioned, Corey Good said he basically took to, took a look at four different pitchers in the pregame warm-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, Reinerts, um, Brant Beck uh, had gotten a look. Um, but again, you know, first inning, I, I think... Uh, Fervita had really had kind of off balance with his kind of uh, with his off speed stuff. I talked with Corey Good after the game. Kind of the plan was let's kind of rotate between. Obviously, Col Fur wasn't going to pitch a complete game. Mm -hmm. It was more going to be like he was going to alternate between slower pitchers and faster pitchers, just trying to disrupt Ileana Christian's timing. And that's a double by Pollock after a base hit by uh, Gavin Young earlier in the inning. So it's second and third, two outs, and then this happens. Jake Seifer, and it just drops in a perfect location in shallow right field. It would go for a double and two RBIs. Zebras lead two to nothing in the bottom of the first. So, you know, Seifer had a big uh, double against Westview and then had another big double against Ileana Christian. Top two, this is the sliding catch. Yeah, that was a sliding yeah. catch by Drew Bowers out in left field. And Rochester, you know, they committed four errors against Westview. They actually did not commit an error at all, any errors in this game. Yeah. Bottom two, good hustle here by Drew Bowers. He is going to beat the play at first. He is safe on an infield single. Unfortunately, that would be their last uh, base runner for a while. Yeah, and that would be their last hit of the game. Top three, and this is a this is a big play, and I mm -hmm. know they don't do replay. I'm going to show this replay yeah. here again, but I mean they just they missed the call. I mean he was looking at Tanner's foot, but he was not looking at the runner's foot, and I they missed yeah. that, and it turned out to be a huge huge momentum s shift. Would Rochester have won the game with that call being made? Probably not, right? Probably but not. It did make a big shift. Yeah, which and obviously. it kept the inning going, and then yeah. that happened. The two-run homer by Scott. So it's the inning being over, and Rochester leading by one. They're now trailing three to two. <coughs> Banstra had homered earlier in the inning. Mm hmm. And then. Uh, Yeah, they scored, what, two more in the fourth and then uh, six in the fifth, an inning that included three bases loaded walks. And also uh, Vanderwood, their star shortstop, had two hits in the inning. He had a homer and a double, and he had three RBIs just in that inning. Mm -hmm. So it was 11-2. It was Rochester cycled through. They went from Brant Beck, Tanner Reinerts, and Gavin Young all pitched in that in that inning. And then that would be a bloop single, and that would score the twelfth run. So now Ileana Christian's up twelve to two. And again, Ileana Christian, kudos to. The, I mean, you know, sometimes pitching staffs are wild, but sometimes the hitters are part of that too. And I mean, they were, you know, what Corey Good talked about was their their plate discipline, and Tanner Post was just tremendous. The last. Five innings of the game, he allowed one hit and no runs, and he struck out Carson Pollock to end the game. Yeah, talking about a uh, pitcher that settled in after a rough start. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
he was unhittable. Right. It was interesting compared to Angle of Westview, who I think we had read a lot about. We didn't really know a lot about Tanner Post. Right. But boy, he was just outstanding. There was a the guys talked about him. There's a little bit of deception to his motion. Mm-hmm. He was kind of hard to pick up, and the ball he really was able to pitch inside of the right-handed hitters for the Zebras, and that was that was really impressive. I I, I thought he was outstanding. Yeah. And it was interesting because they had graduated Corcoran, who was their ace pitcher from who had won the state championship. He was the winning pitcher in the state championship game as a junior in 2022 and as a senior in 2023 through a shutout in the state championship game against Covenant Christian. And then Gavin Meyer, who's going to Ohio State, he's just a junior this year. He's out due to Tommy John surgery. Mm-hmm. I mean, he and he's 6'5", 220. <laughs> I mean, he looks like a pitcher. But without those two guys, they still have, they are loaded in the pitching department still. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. impressive team Yeah, at Ileana Christian. Yeah. I don't know how how in the world were they ranked number twelve? Yeah, going into the postseason, outscoring their opponents fifty six to six. Yeah, to get to the state championship game. You know, Rochester scored fifty uh, percent of the runs that they had given up previous to that. Yeah, they had only given up four runs all postseason. Yeah, Rochester does get two runs in the uh, right. championship I mean, game. You know, they'd beaten Wheeler eight to one, and Wheeler had been pounding the ball prior to facing Leanna Christian. Yeah. And, uh, so. Yeah, I mean this is the. And yeah, I talked with coach. I talked with Coach Vanderwood, Jeff Vanderwood, after the game. He goes, he goes. We talk, pitching and defense are the things we emphasize here. Mm-hmm, and so, mm-hmm. and you saw that. I mean, they didn't commit an error either. Yeah. I mean, they they they. You know, everybody is kind of well. You know, Gowans, their catcher. He's a three year catcher mm-hmm. uh, for them. So they're just a solid team. Yeah, yeah, very good team there. Uh, Rochester's season would come to a close. Twenty one and eleven. One game away from the the state championship game. What a uh, historic season for Coach Good and the entire Rochester Zebras uh, baseball team. And you know they're gonna have uh, they're gonna have a lot of shoes to fill coming up next year. A lot of really really good seniors. Obviously, you know Jake and uh, with Young and gosh all the all the guys that are graduating. Brady know. Beck and Caleb Lutz and yeah. You know I. I I never have done. And Wes Steiner came along, and I know Wes was really. Yeah. I, I, I haven't done a, a Rochester baseball game without Jake Cypher being the catcher. Uh-huh. I mean, we started basically covering them four years ago on a regular basis, and every game that we did, you know, we didn't have to worry about who the catcher was. It was always yeah. Jake Cypher. So uh, that's going to be some big, you know, obviously we talked a lot about him calling the pitches, mm-hmm. you know, his leadership that he would provide and, uh, you know, able to calm the pitchers down at certain times yeah but uh they got a lot of kids coming back too right right i mean when you talk about reinerts and pollock yeah and And then those those two freshmen that really yeah i I think we're going to see casper and coleman take even bigger roles i think we're going to see them both on the mound next year Mm -hmm. a little again a bit more again we have pollock and reinerts coming back yeah uh but i i don't i don't think pitching depth is going to be too big of an issue and then brant beck is of course really Mm -hmm. got his you know, yeah, and what a year he had! I mean, he, just yeah. kind of coming off of the really a, a JV season the year before, and he's going to compete for varsity innings on the mound, and yeah, and where yeah. do you put him in the field? Also, wherever you need to, wherever you need to, yeah, <laughs> he proved that. You know, second yeah. base, right field, right, shortstop, and one guy we didn't talk about much really at all was Zach Parks. Mm-hmm. You know, Zach had Tommy John surgery. I think it was related to a football injury, but mm-hmm. Zach will be back next year. And he, He'll be a junior next year. We've we've still got two more years of Zach. Zach is an if you want to put Zach in center field, he can play there, or maybe he can play another position because yeah. with Casper and Parks, you've got two really good center fielders. That's that's really a nice luxury to have. And in fact, with Drew Bowers, you kind of have three pretty yeah. solid center yeah, you fielders. You saw that catch he had out there in left field. Yeah. I mean, you can you can put him pretty much you know yeah. anywhere in the outfield as well. Uh, you know, we, we always talk about uh, coaches and how do they motivate their kids. It was interesting talking with Corey Good after the game. It was really the kids who motivated him. Mm-hmm. He said he wasn't sure he wanted to be back coaching. Um, oh. He said he thought about it. He goes, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a husband and a father, and I have three I have three kids, and I own a business. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, trying to find a spot for coaching a baseball team. He goes, these guys motivated him. These guys stoked the fire in him. And he said, you know, we're we're at the point now where anything less than a sectional championship is. You know, we need to set we need to set our goals at least that high every year. Yeah, yeah. So these kids have really, you know, changed the standard. Yeah. 
Well, they've raised the bar pretty high, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> See what they can do. So, again, great year. Congratulations to the Zebras, 21 right. and 11 on the 21 season. and 11, and I still remember the day the draw came out. We were like, boy, they didn't get a good draw at all. No, I mean, we, we weren't thinking that they were going to get past Manchester. Yeah. And look, at, look at where they went. Right. So. Right. And after... Last year they did get a buy, and we were raving about what a great draw they did get. Yeah, and they didn't get out of the. And sectional. they didn't get out of the sectional. So, well, let's take another quick break here. We'll come back and talk some more sports with Val. Kriskin's Pools and Spas is your local contractor for all your pool and hot tub installation needs. With a wide selection to choose from, Kriskin's is sure to hook you up with exactly what you need, no matter what your budget is. To learn more about our services, visit Kriskin'sPoolsAndSpas.com. Call 574-857-3100 or stop on by at 7448 Liberty Avenue in Fulton to see how Kriskins can help you. Here we go, Billy. Swing hard. As your local agent, I know you. I know every Saturday your son Billy plays Little League. We sponsor his team. And we know you love parking way too close to the field. That's why we tailor a unique policy for you and your car. Because sometimes, something from out of left field can literally come from out of left field. That's simple human sense. Ask the Jennings Insurance Agency in Argus and Rochester if auto owners make sense for you. Spray foam is not only going to seal up the structure, but it's doing that insulation at the same time. So with a seamless application with the spray foam, you get all of that. You get your air barrier, you get your insulation, and obviously with, with one of the products, you get a vapor barrier as well. Hi, I'm Ashley Samsel with the Insulation Guys. And I'm Kyle Hoover. Let us be your solution to modern energy efficiency. Now more than ever, your business needs fast and reliable internet. Whether you're hosting a meeting, printing invoices, or keeping inventory, your business deserves the best internet speeds to keep everything running smoothly. And to get the best speeds, you need a fiber connection. Here at RTC, we have the solution for you. Contact me, Steve Stricker, to see how we can best serve you, or you can also visit us online at rtc1.com. Welcome back here, talking sports with Val, and you know we did our uh, last show. I guess uh, you just said we did it on the Thursday before the yeah, uh, back on May golf. Thir- back on May thirtieth. Yeah. yeah, before the golf sectional. So we've got um, let's wrap things up with with golf and let's just kind of go down through here. Let's start off at Logan Sport and uh, talk about the uh, sectional at the uh, at Dykeman Park. Well, again, congratulations to Twin Lakes, who won the sectional for the fourth consecutive year. They shot a 300, just an outstanding score. Rochester shot 312. Logan Sport shot 316 to also advance. Boy, there, there, there have been many years where 312 was a good enough score to win the sectional. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And but what a score for the Zebras, though. I don't think. I mean, they had they had lowered their score, but I don't think they gave off any kind of idea that they had a 312 in them. But that was just mm-hmm. a great round. Noah Riffle shot a 72. I followed him uh, for a lot of his round. He was his iron play was just. How much target all all day? How much lower was that three twelve than what they had shot previously this year? I think they had. I don't think they had gone under three thirty. Really? Yeah. So they, wow. Yeah. I'm trying to remember them. Maybe they had gone under once. I know that. I know that they had shot three thirty eight at conference, which was just three days earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure they had gotten under three thirty on the year, but then three twelve included a seventy two from Noah Riffle, a seventy eight from J R McLaughlin. An 80 from the freshman Isaac Heisman, a personal best for 18 holes. An 82 from Davis Reaney, a personal best for 18 holes. And an 84 from Ashton Musselman. Mm-hmm. And he was the kickout scorer, and that was a personal best for Ashton as well. Yeah. So, they, you know, they again, they play the Logan Sport invite every year. They play, plus they play a nine-hole match against Twin Lakes, Logan, and Winnemac every year. So they played 27 holes of golf there before the sectional. So mm-hmm. they, they knew... How to handle that course again? What makes Dykeman Park so unique is that they've got six par threes, and long par threes, like 200-yard par threes, yeah. which are tough for any golfer, but especially for a high school golfer in terms of club selection. And the guys just handled it great that day. So they wind up, so they wind up advancing. Pioneer finished fourth with a 350, um, but the story there was Mike Rand shooting a 78, and uh, Ivan Reyes shooting an 81, uh, both making it as individuals. Mm-hmm. So first kids. 
from Pioneer to Advance to the Regional since. And here's that last name again. Carter Skaggs, who made it in 2012. We think of Carter as a as a basketball player, but he was a really good golfer too, but apparently. Mm -hmm. For the first time in 12 years, Pioneer had sent anybody to the regional. Yeah. Uh, Winnemac, and again, the key was that Pioneer beat Winnemac. Remember, Winnemac had won the conference championship uh, earlier, that shooting a 367 uh, at Round Barn. They shot a 377 at this tournament. Uh, and uh, again, Brendan Hines shot an 83, Talon Garner a 92. Logan Friedel, a 94, Cooper Fulmer, a 98, and Noah Garner shot a 111. And a Fulmer and Noah Garner are graduating, but the other three will be back next year. Uh, Pioneer, all, no seniors. All five kids will be back next year. And then wanted to talk about Caston. Uh, they finished 10th at the sectional with a 413, and that was uh, Lucas Graham led the way with an 87. I think that was the first time he'd been the low Caston score this year. Uh, Max Summers with a 91, Jay Swenschler a 110, Corbin Smith a 117, and Gage Thomas a 124. Only Corbin Smith is graduating out of those five, so four will be back. And they had they had a nice they had three kids on the JV as well. Mm -hmm. So again, give Jeremy Wrenchler another off season to do a little more recruiting. And I think you know, you know, again, I think days will be brighter for Cast. And again, we kind of knew this was a rebuilding year with you know, when they graduated uh, AJ Dag and Colby P from last year's team. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's so again. Rochester was the only team to advance, but the Pioneer had the two individuals advance. Um, then at the regional, which was held at Sandy Pines Golf Club in Demont last Thursday, uh, Rochester finished 12th out of 15 teams. Again, they go from a 312 to a 371. But again, we knew we knew the score was going to be higher because Sandy Pines is just a much different, much yeah. tougher course. And then you throw in just really swirling, hard winds all day, and a tough course just got even tougher yeah and you say swirling it was right but kind of tri-directional right i mean right. any certain point there it could be going a it different changed direction. from shot to shot yeah. and i mean the you know the medalist score was i think like a 75 for a regional that's a pretty high score actually mm -hmm. um and yeah, noah ripple shot an 86 jr mclaughlin shot a 91 uh Davis Reaney with a 96, Isaac Heisman with a 98, and Ashton Musselman shot a 100. Yeah. And then Valley would... Yeah, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to, to J.R. McLaughlin, who, as we speak, is headed to Air Force Basic Training in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Good. Thank you for your service, yeah. and uh, best of luck to you, for yeah. sure. So. Yeah. So J.R. was just a fun kid to cover for four years and yeah. had a heck of a career. So the, the Warsaw sectional actually got moved. Mm -hmm. uh, did we ever hear why? Or it was kind of a late change. It was kind of a late change. I don't. I, again, uh, I don't think uh, Rosella Fort hosted many high school tournaments this year. So, uh, but they, and they wound up not hosting the sectional either. They got moved to Eagle Glen Golf Club in Columbia City. Valley shot a 356 and finished seventh out of ten complete teams. Wes Parker led the way with an 84. Uh, Eli Love shot an 86. Nash Baus had a 90. Uh, Ethan Young had a 96. And Thad Shambaugh had a 121. Uh, Eli Love is the only senior out of that group. Um, the other four will be back. And Parker, Baus, and Shambaugh, all three of those kids are just sophomores. So two more years left of those kids. Again, Valley had a really good year, but just kind of a disappointing end to the mm -hmm. season. I think 356 was one of the higher scores, but scores of that sectional were very high up and down uh, usually at Rosella Ford the winning scores have been right like right around like a 300 mm -hmm. sometimes you have some, you have to get below 300 to win I think this year the winning score was around like 320 mm -hmm. so I think it was just a tough course and tough conditions that day I told you there were some hazards out there yeah okay <laughs> you said so yeah yeah so again but uh the Valley Boys golf team won that INSC preview tournament so looking ahead to next year I mean they're going to be uh again with four returners and uh, again, Wes Parker took another step forward, and he is, you know, taking over that number one spot from Greg Miller. He's gonna, he's got two great years ahead of him, mm -hmm. and uh, very, very should be a very exciting time for Valley Boys Golf. Just a disappointing end of the season, mm -hmm. and wanted to give a shout out to Alex Stacy from Culver. The one man team shot a one fifteen at that sectional. Yeah, well, they should have won then, right? That was the low score. Yeah, yeah, for the team. Yeah, <laughs> not the way it works. No, no, okay. not quite. All right. Uh, any other golf notes here? Uh, that's pretty much all for golf. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but a, a good, again, a good golf season, 
And uh, again, we've got a lot of good kids coming back next year. Obviously, you know Rochester with Riffle and and McLaughlin graduating though. Plus Robert Bazo and Enrique Navarro, who had a big, you know, played at times on the varsity and had some good scores at times. They're graduating too. So yeah, we'll see what we'll see what uh, Mason Heidi does as he starts year three next year. Yeah, sounds good. Well, let's take another quick break here. I know we just took one, but uh, let's catch back up on our breaks here as we want to thank our sponsors that help uh, bring all of our broadcasts to you so we'll take a quick break come back and uh, we'll talk some uh, oh, what do we got a little bit of a wrap up with some uh, baseball and, and softball stuff and a yeah. little track yeah. yeah wrap things up here and when we come back Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to set you up with a new set of wheels from coming on the lot to driving off in your new dream car Mike Anderson strives to give you the smoothest dealership experience Not only that, but Mike Anderson in Rochester is here to lend a hand with their service center to keep your ride running. Stop on in for a test drive or call today at 574-223-2711 to see how Mike Anderson in Rochester can steer you in the right direction. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, we strive to provide our community with a better alternative. We respect the many choices our patients have when it comes to health care needs. When they choose us, we go above and beyond to offer them personalized service and care that will consistently remind them of why we are a superior choice to other pharmacies. Pharmacy care should be proactive when possible. It should be customized to patient needs. It should strive for better health outcomes. It should help manage costs. At Webb's Family Pharmacy, our mission is to provide the pharmacy care you deserve. Fulton County REMC is proud to offer the Operation Roundup Charitable Giving Program. Through Operation Roundup, Fulton County REMC is able to give to local organizations and communities by simply rounding up your monthly bill and donating the change. Since its inception, Operation Roundup has generated over $50 million in charitable donations throughout 260 electric cooperatives. To learn more about this great program, visit www.fultoncountyremc.com or call in at 574-223-3156. Steve Moore Agency is now offering an app to make viewing your policies, make payments, and file claims so much easier and convenient. You can download Steve Moore's Insurance Agent app from the Google Play Store or the App Store. Just search up Insurance Agent and look for the blue app with the large eye. If you want to know more about our services, you can call us at 574-223-3010 or visit us online at stevemoreagency.com. Welcome back here, talking sports with Val. we got a few kind of uh, housekeeping type things to clean up here in the last segment. A couple of uh, baseball softball notes from Caston here. Yeah, obviously a disappointing end of the Caston baseball season with that loss to Southwood in the sectional semifinals. But kudos to Gavin Molnikoff. He was invited to the IHSBCA Futures game. That's the Coaches Association Futures game. And where is it going to be at? Where's where's sister goes to college? Huntington University coming up on June 19th. Okay. And I believe Blake Molnikoff is going to be involved in the coaching of the team for that as well. And then uh, Pete Duvall was named Academic All-Hoosier North Conference and uh, co- uh, Academic All-State as well by the Coaches Association. Yeah. So congrats to Pete. I mean, we, we love Pete. And we're gonna right, listen. right. Pete's our guy. And yeah. We, we loved what, uh, what all, all he did for us, you know, in, in basketball season. And mm-hmm. so we're going to miss him for sure. But yeah. Congratulations on that, for yeah. sure. Softball awards, Addison Simpleman. Uh, we knew she made first team All-State. Um, she's also got invited, and I guess this is not a big surprise if you made first team all state, but she's going to be playing in the North South All Star game coming yep. up on that's next Saturday, June 22nd, and it's in Bloomington every year, and so she'll go down there for that. Yeah, get to play in that uh, before she heads over to Fort Wayne. Yeah, it's usually, a, I believe that All Star game is usually like a double header just to give everybody some good playing time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, I think they play a double header down there. So congrats to, to Addison for making yeah. that. That's yeah. a special honor. Sure is. And uh, we wanted to uh, talk some Valley track. Mm-hmm. Um, Betty Shepard competed in the state finals. That was back last, uh, or two weeks ago, back on May 31st. She was seated 26th in the, three, in the 300 hurdles, finished 18th. Mm-hmm. So a great job, in her, but it was her time, 46.40 seconds, a new school record, and I believe broke her own previous school record by more than a full second. Wow. 
And she's just a sophomore, And right? she's just a sophomore. <laughs> wow. So, we, you know, again, Betty is a special athlete. And, um, again, just being able to focus on one event for a week, I'm kind of curious if that might have helped her out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But she is, she's just a great athlete and just so, I mean, she's really, I mean, she's just really technical but also just really strong and gifted at that event. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, kudos to Betty. Just a great job. And to, it's going to be interesting to see what that final number is when she graduates. Right. Because, it, you know, I think the winning time at State was in the 43s. Mm -hmm. So, but I'll, I'll be curious to see how much faster Betty gets because she's, again, she's got all the, she's got everything that it takes to be good in that event. And, yeah. Uh, really a pleasure to cover her. And has, the, has she been running that for a while? I I don't know. I'd, I'd have to check. I know. Yeah. I, I just wonder what her experience level is. I believe her, is. she has older brothers who were hurdlers yeah. in the past. So, yeah, yeah uh, a great year and a great year for her. And then on the boys' side, Wade Jones finished 20th at state in the 200 meters. He was seated 22nd, finished 20th. Again, you look at the time, 23.16 seconds, and um, you know, again, not the not Wade's greatest time, but again, that was it was a rainy track, and if you look at all the times from that meet, from the state meet, it, all the times were pretty slow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think like only one or two kids broke twenty two, but again, it was it was it was ba the boys meet was running basically a downpour. That was that June first, which yeah. you know we had all the rain that day and rain they, down there. They they had to, they had to move the, the field pole, events. They had to move the pole vault the. Uh, and the they did the long jump, long jump and high jump indoors to yeah. the Mellencamp Pavilion. Yeah, there. So it was just a tough day to run. But mm -hmm. what a career Wade had to make state three years in a row in the same event. I mean, that's that's hard, especially because there are always people gunning for you. Yeah, and you know you're, you're always one bad race away from, you know, from people wondering what's wrong with you. But I mean. And he he was just so consistently good. And again, the, the two hundred was made for him, just like the three hundred hurdles was made for Betty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really looking really forward to combining his strength and speed. Yeah, really looking forward to seeing how he does uh, on the next level and for football. So yeah, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, because he's he's as heady a player as he is a good athlete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a, a good year for Valley Track, and to send you know two kids to to state as well, and then. Um, well, that's pretty much it for the school year. We just wanted to mention girls' golf practice starts on Friday, August 2nd, mm -hmm. and all other fall sports practices begin on Monday, August 5th. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw there's a picture on Facebook. Rochester football is at the Manchester University team camp this week. Yeah, yeah. And I know that I know Coach Schaefer puts a that's that's a, puts a big emphasis on that. That's kind of when he installs his offense and defense and kind of figures out who plays what positions. Mm-hmm. So I mean, as much as as much speculating as we might do, I mean that's again he doesn't he doesn't get too far out ahead of himself there. He, yeah. He uses that Manchester team camp though to figure out kind of who's who do we have and who can play what positions well. It's going to be I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this football team looks like. Obviously, when you lose the kids like Alex Deming and <laughs> I mean that that's going to that is a huge loss and Brady yeah. Beck is a huge loss. Uh, but a lot of good kids will be coming back. Yeah. Sounds like they're going to be really strong on the line. Hopefully Xavier can be back in 100 percent right. on the line. And, and he was con he was doing track at the end, you know. Yeah, he was throwing the shot put yeah. in track. So I think I think we're, we're everybody's expecting him to be back. And again, I'll have to figure out who plays those guard spots. Yeah, you know Peyton Young did a did a great job as well, mm -hmm. guards and center the interior of the line. And then I think we obviously know X, X at left tackle and who's going to win that right tackle mm -hmm. spot. But uh, there's a lot of good young talent there and. Uh, yeah, so that. Uh, but again, we. I, mean, I expect a really good team at Pioneer again next year. I saw they were up at Trine at their wing T camp. At their wing T camp, mm -hmm. yeah, that that was going on this week. They, I don't know what, uh, how to say it, but they said they won the camp or they won the competition or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there's yeah. there's a lot of a lot of schools up there. They've got a good nucleus coming back there as well. Obviously, Ryland Toloza is going to be a big uh, hole to fill as long as. Uh, Caden Hill as well. Yeah, you know, a couple of pretty big, but they got a lot of good pieces coming back. They had a really good young front line, right? Yeah, and cast in this kind of in a similar spot. Obviously, oh my gosh, Pete Duval, but they they bring a lot back. Yeah, a lot back, and they've got a really good, from what I've heard, a really good class coming in. A yeah. freshman, yeah, a freshman, and a good group of sophomores too. Obviously, yeah. them is Pete Duval and Grant Yada, and I mean Grant did Grant, so much mm -hmm. for that team. 
Yeah. But, uh, yeah, an exciting time. And I think Winamax got a lot back, too, as well. I mean, Cash Roth coming back for mm-hmm. another year at uh, at quarterback. And uh, be curious to see how Coach Burgess does with that team in year three. Yeah. And then, of course, year two for Coach Faust at Culver. Mm-hmm. So we will see. And, of course, the, with Valley, I mean, we know, with Valley, again, you, you lose Nate Parker and Wade Jones. But, again, th- that team had a lot of depth last year. And how mm-hmm. they played after Nate Parker got hurt really shows you how much depth they had. Yeah, and they're going to need a new quarterback as well. Right. Cody right. graduating. But yeah. It's going to be interesting, too. You know, obviously you've got down here the, the realignments, you know, the TRC, obviously with North yeah. Miami we're, leaving. We're in kind of a new chapter of high school sports. Yeah, North Miami's leaving. you got Northwestern coming in, you know, joining Lewis Cass, who joined this last yeah. year. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting look, football-wise. Right, and Northwestern's a school that, you know, they've excelled in a lot of different sports. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, soccer. Yeah. Uh, cross country. Yeah. It's going to uh, bring a, an interesting dynamic to the to the league for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Hoosier North, obviously, they're gaining North Miami, who's leaving the TRC. Mm-hmm. But then you got the the other two schools in the, the non football sports with Argus and Oregon Davis. Yeah. And then you know the really interesting dynamic is going to be South Central coming in. To play football in the conference, yeah. So that's going to be interesting. They've been struggling the last few years up at South Central, but football-wise, but you know, traditionally they're a pretty strong program. So right, I would expect that they would get back. You know, they're going to put some athletes on the field traditionally. Yeah, yeah. You know, some good athletes. But uh, you know, Winnemac is going to be the largest school in that conference enrollment-wise. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be curious to see how that looks, and then. It's going to be, you know, eight teams for football and then basically nine teams for every sport except for football. Right, right. Well, and yeah, maybe not exactly every team, every sport, because obviously Pioneer doesn't have soccer. Right, Pioneer does, yeah. You know, so there's yeah. going to be some of those. But mm-hmm. uh, And then, you know, Valley, after a year of uh, independent, uh, they'll be back in a conference again this year. Yeah, the INSC with Valley and John Glenn and Jimtown and Bremen and LaVille and Knox, there are going to be some interesting rivalries that – Kind of are already already in place, and then some rivalries that I think will form in very quick, short order. And I again, that football conference is going to be awesome mm-hmm. right off the bat. It is going to be a great conference. I think Valley's first conference game is at Knox. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is going to be that's going to be a fantastic game. Yeah, yeah. And it's gonna it's gonna be fun too because of all the conference shakeups. We're gonna have uh, games with our teams that we cover mm-hmm. that. Or against teams that we're just not used to seeing them play. Yeah, you know, Rochester playing Northwestern. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Winnemac playing South Central. Mm-hmm. You know, Pioneer playing South Central. Yeah, we, we just haven't seen that. Right. You know, we've seen Culver play South Central obviously every year, but yeah. And you know, Valley did. I they played Jimtown last year, but you know, Valley Bremen. Yeah, conference game. All right, Valley played Bremen last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah but a conference. But now game. a conference yeah. game. Yeah, you know Valley Jimtown conference game. Mm-hmm. Valley Glen. You know yeah. they, they played last year, but now you add that conference mix. Right. You know, so that's it's going to be interesting. Right, and I I, w- I went to Valley last week, saw their new weight room. Pretty nice. I know you've it? been there. It is <laughs> it is more than pretty, pretty nice. nice. It's really really nice, and their new yeah. they have a new football locker room. It is a football locker room mm-hmm. with. You know where you could hang up your shoulder pads, mm-hmm. and it's going to be just for the football team. And um, again, great facilities, and they're not done yet. They're going to put on basically they worked on the drainage of the field, and now they're going to put on a new layer of sod on top of that. So it's going to be a really nice new playing surface there, mm-hmm. uh, and then they add new goalposts and a new scoreboard too. Okay, at, yeah, f- uh, for the football field at Death Valley. Did you see the pool? Not yet. Yeah, so they actually opened it up there on that mm. north side, and now you're going to actually have room for some stands. Yeah. So you can get, get a few fans in there and watch. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's going to be great for swimming because those kids deserve it. But uh, Mr. Kreska was saying that that pool mm-hmm. was the original when they built the school in 75 or 6, whatever. Mm-hmm. So it, it needed a few renovations, and, yeah. and they, they got it. and of course, got a chance to see the girls' basketball locker room, and mm-hmm. uh, now they have a, a coach for the girls' basketball office, which was there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I, I know Rebecca Parker was raving about that when she yeah, yeah. 
get your, get your own locker room and, yeah. and her own office. And yeah. So. And of course, the new sectionals. Uh, you know, again, one thing that Paul Ni- Commissioner Paul Nidig talked about was that for those Class One A sectionals, is that yeah, if you have eight, well, if somebody doesn't play a particular sport, like say Trinity Greenlawn, who doesn't have volleyball or softball, you, well, you can still it's still a seven team sectional. So mm-hmm. we'll be curious to see. That's something we'll take a look at as uh, the summer progresses. Uh, how those sectionals look uh, in the different sports, especially when softball and baseball come out, which we expect to come out in August at the latest. Yeah. All right, well, it's been another great uh, season. I mean, it's hard to believe that it, the whole season is over. I I counted the other day, I was getting ready to do the uh, the latest report, and, and I, I had about 325 live, live streams that we did for the season. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty busy. Yeah. And uh, I think we did a decent job. We went all the way to the baseball semi-states this year, so... We got to do softball semi states last year. We got to do baseball semi states this year. And who knows what we'll get to do in twenty four, twenty five? Yeah, uh, it's hard to imagine that uh, you know it's going to be right around the corner. Mm-hmm. It's going to be here before we know it. So. I'm always thankful for the passion of the kids because if they didn't, if nobody ever wanted to play sports, what would we do? Yeah, yeah, probably wouldn't have a whole lot to do. Yeah, talking sports with Val would be kind of hard to do if we didn't yeah. have sports. <laughs> So I'd just be complaining about the Cubs for an hour and a half. Yeah, but yeah. You don't want to hear that. Um, our we next. should. I mean, we should have all our TC teams coming up the week of July eighth. Yeah. I usually wait until after the moratorium week before doing that. Yeah. So we'll probably do a show. That's that's going to be kind of iffy on exactly when we do that show. We'll post it because it's going to be a little busy in that July eighth right. time that, frame. That, that, that might also be fair week. So yeah, it is. So I, yeah, fair week, and then I got a trip to Louisville coming up for the roses. Okay, and so we'll get we'll get sometime yeah. uh, early to mid July. We'll yeah, get that I'll just say after moratorium week. Yeah, yeah, after so, the fourth of July. Yeah. Uh, speaking of fair weeks, it's uh, we're gonna have a couple weeks off, but we're gonna get right into it. I believe the Pulaski County Fair starts the twenty eighth of June, so we will have coverage of that from the Winnemac Town Park again this year. I think that's our fifth year. Mm-hmm. That we've done uh, Pulaski County, and then uh, we don't have a whole lot of time off. Usually, there's a week between uh, Pulaski and Fulton, and I, don't, I think Pulaski moved back a week, so it's kind of a few days off, and we're going to transition over to Rochester for the uh, Fulton County Fair. So we're going to hit them hard here, coming uh, starting June 28th. So tune in for that, and watch all the uh, fair coverage from uh, Winnemac and Rochester, and. Then we'll have a little bit of a chance to take a deep breath and and relax for a, a week or two, <laughs> and uh, we'll get you some all RTC teams from the uh, spring season, and then we'll get ready for fall sports. I mean, when you hit August, you're you're right there. You're right on the cusp of yeah fall sports kicking off. So, yep, football openers are Friday, August twenty third. Yeah, not that we're counting. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for all your support over the year, and uh, we really appreciate it. We'll be back uh, with some fair coverage coming up uh, shortly, and uh, if you have any uh, concerns or whatever, our phone numbers, our Twitters are all down here. You can always reach out. And, right. I'm also, on my, I'm also on Threads, Instagram, and yeah. Yeah, Facebook. Facebook. For all the old folks out there. Yeah. Apparently that's a old person uh, app now so. yeah all right val thank you for all your you, uh, hard work this year it's uh, been fun had a lot of fun and uh, we'll be back we'll talk some more sports with val very soon